So first of all, um, this isn't my usual style of presentation. Normally I'm disclosing some kind of technical vulnerability and um, diving deep into the details. So this isn't a technical presentation. It's more about my experiences in 30 years hacking and how I've seen things evolve and you know, some questions I've got about where we're going and, and where we've been. I also try to lighten up a little bit. I apologize if it seems like it's too light. So. Bear with me. While we're doing this, hands up, how many of you are hackers? And how many of you are InfoSec professionals? Uh -huh. All right. Interesting crossover. Um, how many of you have been hacking for more than 20 years? All right, so you guys have seen some things. <laughs> like we all have. <laughs> so, who am I? Well, Back in the 80s and 90s, they called me Cyber Junkie. Then it became Sea Junkie. These days, it's CJ. Uh, it just shows that increasingly hackers have become lazy. Um, I'm a hacker. Uh, I'm the VP of Cybersecurity Strategy at Okta, as Katie mentioned. Uh, I'm also a security researcher. Uh, things like Tesla Model S, Touch ID, Google Glass. Uh, I designed hacks for the TV show Mr. Robot. I'm the head of security at DEF CON. And I have way too many hats. But mostly I just like to break shit. So, the question I want to ask is, how did we get from this to this? Because this is where we are today. Well, is it because everything's connected? That's probably part of the answer. Everything is connected. Everything from cars to buildings to toasters. Uh, is it because global and social media have given a unprecedented reach for information? You can literally reach out and touch anyone anywhere in the world. Doing that before was incredibly difficult. And if you kind of, I'll go into the history of information a little bit later on, but you look at the historic methods, none of them had the scope that we have available to us today. Maybe it's because we've been too successful in finding bugs and, cr and making tools. Certainly, most of the government archives of tools have been based on the research that many of us did in the 80s and 90s. And in fact, even some of the tools that some of us wrote in the 80s and 90s. But maybe we've been here all along, and all that's really changed is the volume, variety, and velocity. So cyber information warfare has changed the battlefield fundamentally. Nations now have an unprecedented reach for minimal investment. Small countries can literally reach out and cause mass disruption or even vast economic damage to much greater, greater powers. Attacks can be launched without any human life risk. Or, I mean, as long as you're not within reach of a hellfire missile, I guess. Um, but the reality is, like, you can have a guy sitting in a building halfway around the world causing disruption in the United States, and tracing and identifying that person is incredibly difficult. Ammunition is cheap, and targets are readily available. The number of bugs and systems is expanding exponentially. We still haven't come up with a good way to deprecate old software, and old software equals targets. We also don't really understand how to classify those vulnerabilities in this context very well. Waging asymmetric warfare has never been easier. So we understand the cyber aspect of cyber warfare. We have attacks happening all the time, from the emerging attacks, like things like Stuxnet, through to just a few days ago, the US attacking Iranian shipping. Right. We know that we can reach out, exploit a vulnerability, and cause disruptions to a system. So that's not a massive problem, and I think a lot of the models we have in place are actually starting to tackle that. As we improve bug bounties, as we improve vulnerability disclosure, 
we are starting to make some of these targets harder. Yes, skills are getting lifted up, but at the same time, things are getting better. But what we don't really understand very well is information warfare. And we're already in the age of information warfare. Hey, many people say that encryption was going to end the golden age of SIGINT. I disagree. I think we're now in the platinum age of SIGINT. Because if you look at the collection methods that are available now, I don't need to go and tap into your underwater cables. I can still do that. But at the same time, all I need to do is send you an app that puts cat ears on you, and you're going to go and download all the information from all your friends and upload it to me. I have in my pocket a phone which can take photos close to a mile away, automatically OCR the text, and then upload it to a foreign nation. While I'm certain they're not doing this for evil purposes, the capability is kind of terrifying, and it changes the physical security paradigm. I tested this out uh, by going to certain locations in the U.S. and found that I could essentially breach perimeters by photographing inside sensitive spaces from viewing areas because the zoom is so powerful. And this technology isn't bound to any one nation. This is technology, and you can't stuff it back in the bottle. Data drives influence, and influence is now a weapon. Well-designed information warfare campaigns are self-propagating and highly effective, truly asymmetric methods of attack. Many of you have seen the memes that were used to influence elections across the world. If you get it right, if you make a targeted piece of information, it will spread by itself and it will change minds. And that is a new form of weaponization. It's attacking on the cognitive level. But there's a key point here, and that is it's hard to get right because you have to use intelligence. There have been some spectacular failures where people have tried this attempt, tried this information campaigns as far ago as uh, like in Vietnam, uh, where because of a lack of understanding of the targets, they failed. Uh, there was a very famous one that the Grug likes to mention as a, a, a note, where the U.S. dropped leaflets of pictures of Vietnamese girls in bikinis uh, with Vietnamese text under it asking, what is your girl doing now? The idea being to discourage the uh, Viet Cong and have them surrender, lay down their arms and go and check on their girls. But the effect was they looked at these pictures and thought, what are they doing to our women? We must fight harder to stop them from doing this. And in fact, they doubled their efforts. So getting it right is hard. We've come a long way in a really short time. Information has evolved from simple printing presses through to modern telephony systems, through to things like television, radio, and now social media. Information has become personal. It is in your hand, it's tailored for you, and it's on 24-7. Individuals now have more influence than leaders of state. The example shown here if you look at Katy Perry's followers, she dwarfs either Theresa May or Donald Trump, perhaps for a good reason. Um, but when you start to ask people, how does this influence affect their decisions? If you see the statistics there, 70% of millennials said they're more excited about doing things when their friends agree with it. And 68% of them said they don't make major decisions without discussing it with people they trust. I have already seen targeted campaigns in the U.S. going after millennials to discourage them from voting in the 2020 election because they understand how some of these groups are fragmented and they're driving wedges into the, those fractures. So what are the strategies with information warfare? You can attempt to distort. You can attempt to dismiss real facts. You can attempt to distract from the reality. You can attempt to leverage the fractures in a population and increase polarization. Or you can attempt to dismay and terrify. And I'll focus on the last one with a kind of simple example. But first, how do you influence? Well, a country you can influence through diplomatic ties, through international links, 
through the military or through their economic connections. Business isn't that different. You influence through business deals, PR and advertising, mergers and acquisitions, or research and development and capital instruments. This is why I was mentioning before. You can leverage prejudice, misinformation, and fear to turn a simple information bug that would normally not qualify for a bug bounty, that would normally be marked as won't fix, to display information that can cause critical damage to a nation. Would you fly on an airplane or get in a car if that came up on the infotainment unit? Really? Any? Hands up? Anyone? It's incredibly easy to do. We used to make jokes in the 90s about popping up messages on screens. And suddenly, now, it's a critical vulnerability. As a result of this, hackers are now legitimate targets. We regularly see information in the news about attackers who have been labeled as enemy combatants being taken out. And in quite a few cases, they well deserve it. Right. If you go and involve yourself in somebody else's war, you shouldn't be surprised when they use the, the methods of war to remove you from the battlefield. But at the same time, it's kind of a disturbing change, possibly. The reality is, we've been here for a long time. In the, C, in the, uh, uh, in the like mid to late 80s, the CCC, or specifically a group called the DOB from the CCC, uh, was stealing information for the KGB on American nuclear uh, um, uh, inventions and development, but also stealing information from the KGB. And the information was being sold back and forth. The net result was a member of the, of the CCC was found burnt to death a short distance away from his car without his shoes in a field with a perfect circle of burnt grass around him. Verdict, suicide. So apparently he got out of his car, threw his shoes away, walked into a field, and spontaneously combusted. The reality is, if you play these games, don't be surprised when they use the tactics that they're used to using to remove you from their field of operation. And it's been going on for a long time. As I said before, the only difference now is the volume, velocity, and variety. So, how do we defend against this? Well, we now need to start thinking about vulnerabilities from three angles instead of just one. Instead of just thinking about it's a software vulnerability and what's the cyber impact, we need to think about what's the cyber impact? What's the physical impact? Does this low vulnerability have the effect to allow me to do something in the real world? And what's the cognitive impact? Does this CVS score one vulnerability that lets me pop up a message on an infotainment system allow me to send a message that could cause mass panic and fear? And can I do it to multiple places at the same time? Because if that's the case, then we need to rethink how we're addressing it. And that comes to the the whole idea of classification of vulnerabilities, we need to rethink it. Right now, the way we classify vulnerabilities is based around control of systems. So something that gets a really high score is something that allows you to have remote control of a system. But the reality is there's more to it than that. And because we're allocating our resources to address vulnerabilities based on this current model, it means some of the most serious vulnerabilities in today's age are remaining unpatched or are still getting marked as won't fix. When I went digging through uh, the CVE repository, the number of informational vulnerabilities that are out there that are still open is genuinely terrifying. And I've had no shortage of, of vulnerabilities that I can play with to pop up strange messages on random systems, random networks. I encourage you to take a look yourself. So how much has changed in, in the last 10 years? So much has changed in the last 10 years. You know, our, much of our impact comes from this control system idea. The pitch is much bigger. Low bugs can no longer be assumed to be low. Informational bugs may actually be high. Displaying the wrong message at the right time could be critical. So now 
we need to apply context and intelligence to how we classify bugs. If you get a low bug, what does it mean? Does it give you an opportunity to do something else? I have personal experience with this. The Tesla Model S, almost all of the vulnerabilities I found were either low or medium. But by chaining together a bunch of low vulnerabilities, I was able to gain remote control of the car. Tesla originally struggled to see what the issue was because they were all low and they were allocating their resources based on things that were either medium or high. And I had to eventually show them the impact of chaining these bugs. That's a, an example from just a few years ago. There are plenty more out there. There are people working to change this landscape. Um, I like to call them agents of change. One of them is my good friend, Katie. Another one is a, a good friend of mine called Sarah. Uh, Katie has been working on renegotiating the Wassenaar Agreement. For those of you that don't know, the Wassenaar Agreement is a treaty between countries that controls the distribution of certain types of material. It was designed to stop control the distribution of munitions, or at least limit it. Um, and software was added because software was now seen as a legitimate weapon. It's thanks to the work that Katie's done that you don't have to fill out an export license or application for vulnerability disclosure or incident response. But there's a ton more work to be done, and I would call on all of you in other countries to try and involve yourself in this process and provide support, because if we don't get a handle on this, pretty soon we're going to find ourselves living in a world where every time we walk across a border with a laptop, it gets inspected, and we face the potential of arrest, because our tools of our profession are now classified as weapons. And the reality is that's not going to help anyone, because bad guys don't listen to those things. And in fact, most of them already have tradecraft for how they distribute this information without having to expose it. So all it will do is inhibit white hat research and inhibit the people who are trying to defend. Sarah has been working on disinformation. And I'll show in a minute some of the work that, that she's been doing. They've formed a, a working group that's looking at how disinformation is distributed, how information campaigns are structured, and how we can counter them. Because it's actually a lot harder than you think. Stopping a cyber campaign is as simple as either patching the vulnerability or filtering out the traffic. But that doesn't work with information. Because once an information campaign is in full swing, if somebody, let's say the government, steps in and pushes down hard, there's evidence that shows that actually increases the velocity of the campaign because people get more entrenched and push back harder. So there are inflection points that we need to learn about that allow us to redirect, change, or counter these campaigns. And the work they've been doing is in identifying that, and you'll see in one of the next slides. I'd also like to give a shout out to Pablo Brewer from SOCOM and the Donovan Group, who has been sponsoring and uh, providing a lot of insights to much of this work and helping us get this work up-leveled into the right places. This is what they've produced. I wouldn't try to read it now. It's <laughs> way too much information to just go over in a slide. But what it does is it breaks down information campaigns into artifacts. And these artifacts allow you to understand at what stage a campaign is at and what the right countermeasure might be to counter that campaign at that stage. It also allows you to understand the kind of campaign you're facing and potentially give you some insights to the origin of it. The framework's actually pretty similar to the uh, attack framework that InfoSec has been using for a while. So, conclusion. Hacking has actually always been part of warfare. It's just had different names for different periods of time. We've always been the best tool to do this because unlike the people who get trained in universities, we're passionate about it and we eat, sleep, and drink security. And we think outside the box in a way that's 
kind of dangerous to some people. Hackers will always be the best equipped at offense, but they'll also always be the best equipped at, at defense. We as hackers also have to work on building the right landscape so that there's less risk and that we build trust. And that means we have to be really careful about irresponsible uh, research. Like dropping O days on companies or uh, driving fear in industries actually just serves to hurt us because without that trust, we're seen as the enemy. And we don't want to be seen by, as the enemy by everybody. It also shuts doors and stops us from being able to work with different industry groups on different projects, especially the more sensitive industries. I personally have experienced firsthand irresponsible research being dropped in one area and projects that I've been working on shutting down in another. This is something we have to be careful of. And the last thing is that as hackers, we need to recognize that our actions have a greater impact than ever before. You can literally now get killed for doing the wrong thing. So choose wisely. Now, I seem to have rattled through these slides a lot faster than anyone was anticipating. Uh, I hope people appreciate the extra coffee, but part of that was to give a chance for people to ask some questions. So, um, questions, anyone? So, Mark, um, going back uh, to the slides on um, Sergene and Pablo's um, framework, um, one of the things that they talked about last time um, they talked about this was that it was really important to recognize the misinformation early in the campaign and that there were certain key points that, that you had to be aware of or, or be right on top of in order to divert um, misinformation or, or block it entirely. Um, can you speak to, to what you think those points might be? I, I can't actually say in detail what the points are, because that's not my area of expertise. It's why I, I blatantly ripped off their slide. Um, but I have put links in so that once the deck's uploaded, you can go to their site and see this. But it's absolutely true, because these information campaigns build momentum. And there are points where you can influence them and change direction. But if they get too much momentum, it gets increasingly harder to stop them, and you have to use increasingly more drastic measures to try and counter them. The worst thing, ultimately, is to try and stop a campaign that's in full swing. Because at that point, almost anything you do can add fuel to it, especially if it's a divisive type of campaign where they're trying to say that, the government is doing something bad or a particular group is doing something bad because then they simply take any action as censorship and proof that what it was saying was was strong. So what I will say is that the things that you do to change it really do depend on how the campaign started and where it started. Um, but these campaigns are becoming obvious. The campaign against millennials for the um, uh, the 2020 election were picked up by my, my teenage daughter. She was browsing through uh, Tumblr and browsing through Instagram and seeing these memes coming out. And she came to me and said, Dad, this looks a lot like some of the stuff that I hear you rambling on about to mum. And she was right. I mean, I mean, essentially what it was was a meme that said, you should not expect your candidate to win. Your candidate will not make it through the primary. You should show your displeasure by not turning out to vote. And, you know, we all understand the impact that had in 2016 when Bernie Sanders voters refused to turn out in despair because their candidate didn't get selected. It massively skewed the potential results of the election. And so the same thing can easily happen again. We haven't addressed the underlying problems. We haven't healed the underlying fractures. And these people are smart, and they're observing, and they're tuning their campaigns based on the fractures they see and driving wedges into them. So some of what we have to do is about healing the overall system and closing these fractures, but some of it's recognizing when these things start spreading 
that they really need to be nipped in the bud early. Things that fill me with dismay is when I hear social media sites saying, yeah, we recognize that this is misinformation, but we think there's value in not censoring it, so we're going to let it continue. That's the worst thing. Popping a message underneath something that says, this is potentially misinformation, that doesn't help. Actually, with some campaigns, that helps the campaign. What the answer is, is, is difficult. And our good friends Sarah and Pablo are working on this. Um, but what I would say is we all need to better understand how information is used. And we all need to understand better the value of information. The fact that we're willing to trade all of our personal information, including very clear biometric information, just to get a pair of cat ears and a photo, is terrifying to me. Um, many people have asked me what I thought the uh, FaceApp campaign was about. FaceApp essentially effect harvested more than 150 million faces across the world. Well, if you consider one of the greatest technical problems that's being worked on across countries, it's facial recognition. The biggest flaw in it right now is that every model that's being built has massive bias issues. So a facial recognition model built in China is great at recognizing Asian faces, but sucks at recognizing any other race. And the same goes for the West. The only way that you can fix that is by having a much bigger, unbiased data set. And you know, many people have said, well, why couldn't they just go into Facebook and collect it? Well, the reality is, on an information campaign, if you have to go out and collect every piece of information, you are expending the effort, and it's no longer really a good ROI. If, on the other hand, you can send out a single artifact and have everyone send the information to you, now you're cooking, and now you're getting some real intelligence. Whether or not the FaceApp stuff was directly a information gathering campaign from Russia, I don't think anyone can say without knowing from the inside of the company. But I will say is it definitely built the best non-biased facial data set I have seen anywhere. Next question. Can you go back to Hagbard? Actually, it's the CCC guy. Because I'm going to ask you something that, at the end, maybe it's not a question to you or to us that we know the stuff, but it's to the audience. Because I was touched by the example that you made to your daughter. Uh, I was hacking with Pango. Is the alive guy. Uh, Hagbard, uh, we were located like at the end of the 80s. So I'm old. X25 hacking and so on and so on. Uh, I think a few people, you guys know that be, uh, because of thanks to these two, two guys, the cyber war, uh, world started like that in 1986. And not now, it's not anything brand new. But also digital forensics started from there because from this incident are, uh, are uh, one of the most great books in the world is the is by Cliffy, by Clifford Stoll. So I'm going to ask, I, I would like you to ask to the audience, how many of you know this book? Because in Asia, there, there, there is a huge lack of history of information security and hacking. And everything that this, you are my, my new hero, I just met, I did, I didn't know so much about you, uh, live, but you explain the things that all of the audience should understand and learn and apply back to everything they did in the past and, and why they are here. And, uh, and I'm kind of sure that your keynote would help or is going to help us, I hope, and anything the audience to change their life in another way. So what I want to ask you is why we keep on not to learning from the past mistakes and the history because Everything is playing back again and again. It's the same shit, it's the same mistakes, it's the same things. Why they still don't understand? So I think there's a lot of answers to that. Uh, first of all, I don't think it's just an Asian problem that there's a lot of knowledge of history because if you ask the same question, like I asked a very well-known German researcher friend of ours and he could only vaguely answer what this was. This is not a problem 
to any specific region. This is a problem across the whole industry. Um, so to the first point, how many of you have read Clifford Stoll's Cuckoo's Egg? Yeah, a few of you. Okay, that's good. Um, what about uh, uh, the Stuckneck uh, book? Again, a couple. I think the problem is we have been incredibly successful in creating an industry. It's an industry that grows exponentially every year. And we have people coming in who are new. And they don't, like, many of them identify themselves as infosec professionals. Right? So they don't learn about the hacker histories and things because they don't see themselves as hackers. They see themselves as infosec professionals. It's a different identity with a different set of rules and different set of code. That's not a bad thing, but we need to start combining some of the knowledge because you're absolutely right. You know, I'm tired of making posts on Twitter saying the 90s called they'd like their bug back because like it's a harsh reality that we keep seeing the same things over and over again because we keep forgetting the lessons. Like just two weeks ago, I was dealing with a problem because of war dialing. Because, like, companies historically used to divide up sensitive systems into different hunt groups and away from their main numbers so that it was harder to find them. They've stopped doing that because they don't think anyone does it. And so you use these old techniques and suddenly you're finding dial-ins that don't have any good authentication and let you straight into simple systems. And those simple systems have no protection because... Why would you protect a printer or why would you protect a fax machine? And, you know, those of you who were at the talk yesterday will know exactly why you protect a printer or a fax machine. I, at the end of the day, anything man makes, man can hack. And if we don't keep reminding ourselves of this, we're going to keep getting caught short. And the other issue is people are too rigid in some of their ways of thinking. And that's where I think the hacker history can help. I, just because it doesn't have an obvious API doesn't mean it isn't vulnerable. I've routinely hacked supermarkets with barcodes because most barcodes are connected to Windows machines and you can send a barcode that tells to turn on the uh, keyboard emulation and then you can push another barcode through that sends commands and off you go. And this will work in like 90% of the supermarkets out there. Right? Anything that users can have input to can be attacked. And the results of those attacks can be quite surprising because there's no cyber defenses to stop that from happening. Um, so I think the problem is just this influx of new people. And somehow we have to become archivists and preserve this knowledge and bring it out. I myself have been asking people questions. Hey, here's a, here's a one. How many of you have heard of the 8LGM? Two people. Did you know the 8LGM essentially started the whole concept of buffer overflows in Sun equipment and that they wrote almost all of the early Sun exploits? They were one of the most prolific hacking groups of the 80s and 90s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I know them quite well. Um, <laughs> but many people don't, under, don't realize that the British hacking scene flourished almost as much as the American hacking scene did and around the same time. And because we're forgetting these things, we're losing chunks of history. That's why I was really delighted to see the book come out about the CDC. Um, and I want to see more of these kind of books come out. I want to see this knowledge captured and I want to see it become mandatory reading in universities so people can learn where we came from because there's a famous quote about not forgetting the mistakes of the if you don't learn from the mistakes of the past, you're doomed to repeat them. Next question. Um, how about we move on to the Slido series of questions. We have a number over there. Let's bring it up to the main screen. I think the first one may be a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, technically, given that when he's typing most of the time, it's actually a, uh, a Macromedia Flash animation uh, <laughs> of one of the researchers or technical assistants, like, for example, myself typing. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> but I tell you, he probably has a better grounding in stuff now than anyone else I've come across. In Hollywood. <laughs> 
All right, uh, moving on to the next one, which is now actually the highest voted question. Yeah, so this is the problem. Um, the reason it was so successful is because we don't understand the value of our data and we are willing to surrender it for trivial prices. And a lot of the time, we disassociate ourselves from the impact. So we go, well, you know what? It's only a bit of Facebook information. Why should I care? Well, you should care because if you are enabling someone to build a profile that includes you and your friends, bad things can happen. Now, there's a really good real-world example of this. Um, ha any of you heard of the story of the Golden State Killer getting caught? So the Golden State Killer was uh, uh, a serial rapist and murderer that was actually a police officer when he was doing it, but decades ago. And no one had caught him, but they did have DNA samples. And so what they did was they went to the DNA databases that all of you are submitting to find out what your percentage of race are, and they went mining. And they found distant family members of this killer by partial matching DNA profiles. And from that, they were able to identify a group of people likely related to him, and then they were able to drill in and find him. That's the risk of a relational database that links you to everybody else. While in that context, maybe the outcome's a good one, you know, a killer got taken off the streets, consider that in terms of an intelligence operation. If a nation state is able to build a profile that knows who you talk to, when you talk to them, and can link you several links down the line, you may not be exposing yourself, but you may be exposing your family, your friends, all sorts of other people. And once that data goes out, you can't get it back. I don't care what GDPR says. Like, you try going knocking on the door of a Russian company and tell them, hey, GDPR gives me the right to be forgotten. <sighs> Not going to work. <laughs> like, and we have the same problem with other countries with different privacy laws. If you give up that data, you have almost no idea what it can be used for. And this is what I meant by we need to understand information warfare better. Because that means understanding the impact of surrendering this data so that we can better communicate to people. One of the best defenses that we can build is if we can weaponize our own citizenry against disinformation. If you can arm them with knowledge on how to recognize these artifacts, how to recognize these things, and what to do when they see it, that's the most effective way. Way more effective than coming in with censorship or overreach to try and stop things from happening. Thank you. Um, let's, how about let's take one more question and then, and we'll wrap it up. For the second question, uh, the second highest voted, it's the one on top now. Or if you like, whichever question you prefer. Um, it's tough because I'm British and I, I sympathize with my government, and I understand what they're trying to do. Well, I sympathize with some of my government. I wish some of them would go away. Um, <laughs> but I... I <laughs> you're not going to get me saying anything else. I am British, after all. Um, I understand why they're trying to do this, and anti-radicalization is a really tough problem. I'm actually working on it uh, from a different angle. Um, I don't think government-driven campaigns are likely to be very successful because they can just be twisted and used to drive and fuel some of this stuff. It may help in some small cases, but I don't think it's the solution that we're looking for. Um, what I'm working on is trying to build a curriculum to be taken into schools to teach the kids about this sort of stuff, but also a second set of curriculum to teach teachers and parents how to recognize when kids are, A, showing cyber potential because we actually need to start hiring these kids early and putting them into classes where they're trained because those kids are the future of our defense in, in, in the, the years to come. And if we don't filter them out, they're going to end up making the mistakes that I made and many of you made as hackers. I, it's only but the, by the grace of God that I'm not in, in jail for some of the things that I did as a kid. I, the mistakes you make as a kid today can have way more penalties. 
And so we have to catch these talented kids before they express themselves in a way that expresses them into jail. Um, the same time, we need to also teach parents and teachers how to recognize this stuff because they're not equipped to deal with it. But if we can teach them the signs to look out for, we can help give them the tools to do something about this. And I think it's at that level that you're going to have much better impact at dealing with radicalization. All right, I think that wraps us up for the question and answer session. Mark, thank you very much for kicking us off to an amazing start of day two at GC. Can we go back to the slides? I just had one last thing. 